Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our readers and listeners of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position, along with your favorite beverage, to enjoy the discussion. We've got a special show recap of the OSM Uranium 2019 conference that was held in Adelaide, June 4 and 5, 2019, in South Australia. Brandon Monroe of Bannerman Resources has consented to join me in this discussion. Brandon, how are you doing? Yeah, great. Thanks, Andrew. What about you? Ah, doing well, doing well. Uh, recovered from the, uh, the travels uh, over to Australia, which was uh, fascinating and fun and uh, quite uh, refreshing. How about you and, and uh, what did you think of the conference? Yeah, well, the first thing, it was great to have a international uranium conference on my side of the world. I'm normally the one doing the hard yards and the long yards traveling, as you experienced in this trip. So uh, I thought it was a great conference. The OSIM International Uranium Conference tends to be very technical. It tends to be a lot of engineers, a lot of geologists, a lot of geophysicists, uh, mineralogists and so on who are attending and it's high quality technical information so that they can accrue OSIM professional development points and so forth to maintain the currency of their qualifications. So on the one hand, it still had a lot of that. And I found that particularly useful because I'm constantly on a journey of trying to improve my knowledge in the sector. But also I'd like the fact that they introduced a lot more market and sector oriented presentations and commentary than I've experienced at that conference in the past. And in particular yours, Andrew, which I, I sitting in the audience of your presentation, I really enjoyed the way that you opened up the big picture for a lot of the geologists and the engineers sitting in the audience. I think many of them for the first time probably realized what this is all about. They're actually employed by people to create shareholder value, not to design the next whiz bang system or find the next amazing uranium mineral in the world. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And I kind of got that same piece from being in the audience for the first day and most of the second day, looking at a number of technical presentations, which uh, were well above my head. And so it was good to kind of grasp some of those uh, and follow along while others was very were very difficult for me not being from that type of background to follow, and uh, I, I think that there was a couple presentations that kind of broke that up, and I think that was kind of my goal because I after the first day I went back to my presentation and kind of took a hard look again at, at how I was going to put it together to kind of break up the audience a bit, and uh, I think it worked out pretty good, and so I made some small modifications to it, and and uh, I think it was receptive. Uh, the audience was receptive to what I put together and uh, really a fascinating conference overall. What would you see as kind of uh, some of the big picture points that came out of it? We saw some really interesting big picture points, I think, Andrew. The, the first one was a couple of very good presentations started with Scott Melby from uh, Uranium Royalty Corp introducing some of the very substantial progress that nuclear is making on the world stage at the moment. And I think for many people in the industry and probably many uranium investors as well, uh, they don't get the opportunity to spend time not at the helicopter view, but at the satellite view of what's happening in nuclear and how close we are to a real tipping point in the general acceptance of nuclear. So Scott started off by talking about some of the progress that's being made in export markets and other markets uh, with not only conventional nuclear power plants, but also SMRs. Uh, you might recall that in the one slide, he gave a projection that the global market for SMRs could be 65 to 85 gigawatts by 2035. You know, and that's, uh, that's a very substantial addition to the existing conventional nuclear reactor fleet because the applications for SMRs are, it, only in very limited circumstances do they cannibalize the demand for conventional nuclear reactors. Most of the time, they're in situations and circumstances where they're entirely complementary. So Scott talked about uh, the deployment of SMRs 
into remote locations, for example, where it's just not feasible to run a conventional nuclear power plant, onto smaller grids, such as we have in Australia, where there aren't many opportunities to build a four to six gigawatt power plant, but there are a number of relatively small coal power stations that are looking to be phased out. And he pointed out that an SMR is a perfect way of switching a grid from a, say, a two or a 300 megawatt coal-fired power station into an SMR. You can pop it right there in the same place, connect it up, and uh, with an absolute minimum of disruption to the surrounding grid, you can use all of the infrastructure that's already in place. So those sort of applications, whether they're uh, land-based, water-based, uh, and even other more flexible applications of SMRs, I think are broadening the market for nuclear. So that was really interesting. We also then heard from other, I think, legends in the uranium space, Tony Gray, Ian Hall Lacey, and a couple of others, who talked about the progress being made at an intergovernmental level. Uh, so, for example, the Tony Gray described the recent IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, decision to include nuclear as essential. Uh, he feels that it has the potential to recast the entire nuclear debate. Um, in other words, the world's premier organisation on climate change says the climate change target simply cannot be achieved without it. So that's kind of remarkable because that's a, the IPCC is an organisation which is heavily influenced by various green groups. The green lobby has got so much power within that organisation and the various advisory bodies that feed into that organisation. And clearly what we're seeing now is finally a recognition at the very most important and influential policy making bodies that the arguments against nuclear, even from hardcore green groups, they're simply being overwhelmed by the urgency of the need here, the urgency to arrest uh, emissions and a recognition that we simply can't do it without nuclear and an expanded role of nuclear is required. So I found those sort of discussions and those sort of comments, um, it's not new to me and I know it's not new to you, but for many people in the audience, uh, it was really quite a shot in the arm for those working in the uranium sector to see how much the bigger picture is opening up and just how much further demand is going to come down the pipeline towards us. Really good points. And there was a lot of takeaways. It's tough to consolidate everything into into one discussion here. But with the SMRs, another key part that was that was coming to mind when when Scott was discussing it and, and some of the, the topics there was the deployment of these SMRs into small scale economies. You look at a country Central America, for example, is a fantastic example. Um, South America is another example that's not too bad. Uh, there's other places that, that uh, people can think of as well, but these economies can't step out and you know buy a $15 billion conventional plant. And so SMRs really provide a, a supplemental solution to that where, where they can assist, for, for example, a country like Panama that's got a lot of hydro, you can step into SMRs for an affordable amount of money and supplement and really build out your energy mix. And so I, I like that thought. And then also taking it small scale place, well, it's a territory of the United States, Puerto Rico, that literally gets destroyed every year by hurricanes. And how nice would it be to have SMRs, specifically the new scale design uh, in a place like Puerto Rico to where hurricanes would not phase the actual energy supply. Sure, you can argue that it would, if they've got you know above ground power lines and so forth, they've, they've got some challenges with their infrastructure, but uh, SMRs in a country like Puerto Rico or a territory like Puerto Rico would be fantastic. And so I think SMRs have so many supplemental and as you said, complementary to conventional nuclear, it really makes a lot of sense. Yeah, great point. Yep. Another thing I saw too, Brandon, was uh, the folks that were there you don't have those same audience. You don't have those same people going to conferences in North America. 
And so for the North American audience, going to a conference like this is really in being in a different world. Uh, you have a whole different set of guests that you would not get in the, in North America. And so I think that's important for people to kind of change that perspective. Um, I think that's a good, a good key piece. And then the other interesting thing about this conference, and these are kind of my takeaways, are the complete spectrum of subject matter. We had geology. We had uh, effects of radiation on plant life and human life. And these studies on the other side, the mining side, the processing side, the controls and build out side, uh, literally the whole industry. And then of course, high level, you know, nuclear energy and everything else in between what I just said. So you have the whole spectrum of components making up an industry, which is really fantastic. And so I liked that component of it. It wasn't just, you know, look at these stocks in an exhibit hall and, you know, everything's related to equities uh, because that's not all of it. Yeah. And interestingly, uh, a number of the more technically oriented people, the folks that you wouldn't see so often in North America, they really enjoyed the equity side of things. So they really enjoyed hearing your perspective on your presentation. They enjoyed hearing Marcelo Lopez from L2 Capital giving a presentation. And uh, of course, we also they enjoyed Scott Melby's take on the market and some of those other things. So I think the what you experienced was very mutual. And I think for the, your listeners, it's worth touching on what you talked about, Andrew, uh, because if I paint a picture here, we've got a room of about 70 people all sitting at tables who are good and solid note takers as a geologist and an engineer should be when they're accruing their professional development points. And uh, yeah, you came on and you basically talked them through how to construct a portfolio or your processes and methodology in which you construct your portfolios and advise your listeners. So it was really interesting for me just to hear you break it down. We've talked about a lot of these things before, but to see you structure that methodology and talk uh, systematically through all of the considerations that you find important. But it was also fantastic for the audience members who are typically sitting within a management structure or within a technical team to hear about, for example, how important talent selection is to your process. The, the slide that you put up there where you talked about not all teams are created equal, uh, the fact that uh, management teams have to be very disciplined with their capital and their G&A expenditure and how important that is the, to the way that you and others select the stock. You know, those messages are fantastic to go in, down to technical teams who in many cases look at budgets in a vacuum that the budget is the only relationship of the budget is what gets passed down from the board versus what they can spend this way they started to see how budgetary discipline influences investor decisions um, i love the way that you talked about uh, talent that knows how to pull through difficult times in the bear market and so forth uh, so that just as an example for your listeners uh, i think paints a picture of how Whilst on the one hand, it was great that you had access to all of these technical people and you can pull them up in a in a coffee break or a lunch break and say, look, you, you know, that was interesting, but can you explain it to me a bit more? But equally, uh, I saw them doing it with you as well. And I think that really enriched the experience for everybody. Yeah, I think so. I, it was it was tough to delineate to the audience um, a complex topic like portfolio strategy. And so I tried to give a kind of a high level overview with the intention that if you know if people wanted to look a little bit deeper, they could kind of dig into our report. Um, and so I think there was a little bit of, you know, uh, interest off of that. And then, and then the uh, breaking up the audience and trying to get the audience to communicate with as far as, you know, the polls about the jurisdiction, uh, the polls about the number of uranium stocks that they have in their portfolio, uh, those, and then also, uh, you know, the count, the jurisdiction, and what they look for in a, in a positive, you know, situation as far as the management team and what, what is important to them. Is it the deposit? Is it the grade? Is it the management team? So I think that was important. And so I think I tried to give a simplistic view for them to take a look at and take away from. And uh, hopefully we, we got that across pretty well and it was a good breakup. One of the other things that um, I caught out of this is there was a couple members uh, in the audience that had mentioned 
you know, look, we are talking to a group of converts. We're talking to a group of people who are in the industry. They have an opinion on nuclear power. And how do we get that message out to other people that are not here? And I, I was thinking about that over really the last week or so. And uh, I think people need to look at how they can, and it's really a person by person basis, how you can go out and you can find that person that's on the fence, that neutral person that maybe doesn't know anything about nuclear power or understand anything about what happens when they plug in their phone charger into the outlet or plug in their Tesla uh, auto into the, the garage at night um, and reach out to those people that are on the fence and reach out even to the people that are officially out of the closet anti-nuclear, which they're probably pretty well decided. But look at those other groups of people who don't know anything about it and talk to them about it. And uh, I think that's something that everybody can do. And so I, I was thinking about that, and, and it really makes sense. And we're going to try to make some efforts to reach out to some of the anti-groups to at least get them talking, even though if we can't convert them back, at least get them talking. So that was another piece that uh, I was thinking about that kind of came up at the conference. Yeah, and Andrew, how did you like the straight talk about some of the shortcomings of renewables? <laughs> I don't know where to start with that one, but I can tell you that, uh, and you know more about the Australian uh, issue, which it's which is certainly an issue that's come up there about some of the promises that never were delivered. But I can tell you, uh, folks have not yet to reap what is coming with the whole renewable experiment as far as the waste, the replacement, the lifespans, the actual real carbon footprint. These things are not renewable. Trust me, they've got a lot of waste. Well, absolutely. There, there was one very good piece of analysis that Julian Tapp, who's the chief nuclear officer at Vimy Resources, provided uh, where he really pulled back the onion and peeled away the layers on some of the relative carbon emission, life cycle carbon emission studies of nuclear versus wind, solar, onshore, offshore wind, et cetera, et cetera, right up to coal, of course. Uh, so a wonderful piece of economic analysis. But he pointed out that the material intensity of a wind farm is 10 times that of a nuclear power station. And even when you take into account the carbon intensity of mining uranium, it's still half of what the life cycle carbon intensity is of a wind farm and a quarter of what it is for solar. So those sort of factual uh, economic analyses really added depth, I think, to the presentation and to your point about people going out into their communities and talking about these issues. There's nothing like the confidence of seeing someone really pull apart these numbers citing the studies that have been done, not only citing the key studies, but going back into their references and their assumptions. And in many cases, some of these assumptions about nuclear power date back decades. Somebody did a study in the 70s or the 80s, and that has just been incorporated into another study. Those numbers have just carried forward into another study. Um, so the one example that I loved, just to give your audience a feeling for the depth of the analysis and the discussion, was the carbon intensity of nuclear power across its entire life cycle. Uh, the UN does their numbers based on an old study when gaseous diffusion was still uh, one of the methods used to enrich, whereas now we're entirely centrifuge enrichment across the world. But the problem is that gaseous enrichment uh, is uh, gaseous diffusion enrichment that consumes about 10 times the electricity of uh, centrifuge. So all of a sudden, these numbers, a large part of the emissions consumption with nuclear energy is the actual enrichment process because it's very power hungry. So first of all, they were using the wrong technology to come up with the numbers. And secondly, there was an assumption that that power that was consumed in the enrichment process uh, was itself generating emissions through coal-fired 
power stations, which we know is just untrue because all of these facilities are built right next door to a nuclear power station. That's how they generate their economics and their low cost of power. So that's the sort of depth that we were exposed to. And it means that you walk out that door and you go into your communities or your shareholders or, or prospective investors with a real strong conviction about what we're doing in the nuclear industry and how important the role is that it needs to play. I find it fascinating that you, that places in California, in Northern California, in countryside that never would deserve putting down big wind and solar farms is happening in places near Monterey, California, which is some of the most lush, impressive West Coast countryside uh, of the United States. And yet it's being consumed with these big fields of solar and, and different projects. And it's really saddening to see it's going to be interesting to see what happens with with this whole movement and how the experiment has really just been throwing money, good money after bad. Uh, Tesla was had a promise to uh, to a project there in Australia. Can you fill in the audience on that one for those who don't know? Uh, so we've had a debate going on in South Australia for the last few years. And in fact, there was even a royal commission, which is a special form of parliamentary inquiry we have in Australia into whether there is a greater role that Australia can play in the nuclear industry beyond just simply digging up and exporting uranium. And in particular, that Royal Commission recommended that we should look further into a long-term high-level waste repository, deep geological storage. So in that context, South Australia has had very significant problems with not only brownouts, but also blackouts which is absolutely unforgivable in a first world country like Australia that's so endowed with energy resources, um, whether it's fossil fuels such as coal and gas, or of course, more conventional um, emission free energy such as nuclear. So go back to 2016, there's a lot of debate floating around the world um, about South Australia's failed experiment with renewables. And uh, they had some, a, a, period of time, for example, during a storm where one of the transmission lines, the interconnectors with the neighbouring state of Victoria went down and the entire state was without power for four days. Can you imagine that? An entire state without power for four days. And, you know, Adelaide, as you saw yourself, it's it, it's hardly a massive metropolis by US standards, but it's a significant city that's the capital city for a vast amount of area and a lot of industry. And apart from all of the huge disruptions we had to domestic life, to commercial life, um, there were some high profile smelters that had huge problems as a result. And there's been a number of large scale investments in the resources sector that have been deferred since then um, because of the concern about power. And as you well know, with a, um, with a smelter, if it runs out of power, all of the pipes block up and you can have some huge ongoing issues and expenses. So anyway, so uh, what we saw was a little bit of Twitter commentary back in 2016. Um, Australia doesn't have too many tech billionaires, um, but we do have a couple and one of them called Mike Cannon Brooks uh, basically was niggling Elon about South Australia's power problems. And Elon Musk promised that via Twitter, um, he can fix South Australia's power network in 100 days or it's free. And so started a process where uh, he gave a guarantee that the lithium ion storage solution, which was installed at Honsdale in South Australia, would be installed within 100 days after the government gave it the go ahead. So they negotiated for about three months. And then we had a 129 megawatt hour facility installed next to a Honsdale wind farm. Um, the government was very quiet about the cost. Um, and by the way, Tesla did install it within the 100 days, so they, they got paid for it. Uh, eventually, it came out what the total cost of that is, um, which uh, Scott uh, Melby said was $150 million, which is pretty close. And the great disappointment in that is I think the people of South Australia thought that for that investment, their problems would go away. They wouldn't be subjected to the humiliation and disruption of brownouts and blackouts in a first world country. But actually all of that facility does is it provides stability. 
it provides several minutes of transitional power when solar or wind power uh, falter. And all that does is it gives a chance for gas turbines to be turned on. So it's really just a switch that stops uh, everyone's computers and lights turning off for a couple of minutes while they start up fossil fuels. Another way of looking at it is it can provide 30,000 homes with about three hours of power. And uh, so it's really done nothing other than provided grid stability. And in the period since it was installed, we've had a host of problems still in South Australia, um, including blackouts, um, total power failures, uh, not even load shedding like we're used to in um, Southern Africa, for example, or South Africa. So we had a very receptive audience, I think, sitting in Adelaide, South Australia for the conference to hear about some of the shortcomings and some of the limitations of renewable energy. Uh, because many of the people there had experienced it firsthand. It's nothing more than just an automatic transfer switch between a backup generator on a residential house or a, or a commercial building. <laughs> it's, it, there's nothing else there. And uh, I, I think back to the SMR piece and Australia, will Australia start to use SMRs before they actually build their first conventional plant? So I think that's another interesting angle to it. And I think people in Australia are starting to warm up to that. I had a a long conversation with a couple uh, on the flight back to LA about Australia and nuclear power. And uh, I think by the time the flight was over, they were tired of listening to me, but I think also they were reconsidering their position on nuclear power. <laughs> you talked them into submission, well done. Yes, yes, exactly. So was there any other guests uh, that you, people that, that showed up there at the conference that uh, you wanted to highlight that were, uh, kind of people who showed up that weren't speakers, but uh, but just showed up out of the blue? Yeah, there were lots of interesting people and um, quite a few CEOs of uranium companies. And that's part of the transition from being a very technically oriented company uh, conference to being more of a market conference. Um, so we had good representation from Namibia, for example. Uh, Dr. Gabby Schneider was there, who's the director of the Namibian Uranium Association. She was a speaker. Uh, the companies that were represented there from Namibia was obviously Bannerman, represented by myself. Uh, Deep Yellow had a good contingent there. Maranika was there. Paladin Energy uh, was there. Um, and then the other thing that was really helpful, I think, is having Energy Fuels represented there, not only by Mark Chalmers, who's the convener of the conference, but also by Curtis Moore, who wrote uh, the Section 232 petition originally. It was his responsibility. So being able to get that contemporary insight as we're coming to the end of that process and really understand where they're thinking, where they're at, uh, what sort of reaction they're getting from the utilities, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that was really helpful for me to be able to sharpen my view on where we're going with Section 232. Yeah, I think that uh, there was some interesting points that came out of that presentation by Curtis, and he did a nice job uh, putting that together for the audience, uh, which which is an audience, you know, generally from not from North America. And we'll see. We'll see if there's a uh, outcome here in the next 30 days, if something comes out. I know there's some a little bit of uh, anticipation building up with some of the stuff that's going on recently. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, this uh, this week ruled on Virginia uranium. But I'm absolutely excited for what's coming. I mean, if there is if there's a negative outcome on 232, if there is an extension until the end of the year on 232, irrespective of that, I'm absolutely fascinated to see where this market's going. It's going up or it's going down. We've been trading sideways and everything has been frozen for the last uh, quite a while. I'm absolutely just fascinated to see where this goes because it's certainly going up or it's going down. And if either way it goes, I'm excited because there are so many opportunities both on the downside and on the upside. And at the end of the day, regardless of 232, this market is eventually going to go up. So if it does go down in the short term, Brandon, I, I kind of see that personally as a blessing from an investor standpoint, if you have capital available to deploy. Um, so I'm, I'm just absolutely excited. I think we've got a fascinating next six to 12 months and uh, I think we're ready. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. I, my view on Section 232 is 
the only negative outcome as far as the market's concerned is a delay on a decision or a, a decision that doesn't have clarity. Any other decision, you, you use the word negative and I assume you're referring to negative from the petitioner's point of view, but any other decision I see is positive because we've got a market that's been paralysed for a long period of time, as you say, and there's an awful lot of business that people just want to get on with in this sector and in, and in the spot market. And it doesn't make sense to do that business right now <clears throat> when we are three weeks away from a likely decision. So just the act of lifting that uncertainty and having clarity going forward will create a whole range of activities. And then you've got laying on top of that a resumption of spot buying by Cameco. Uh, they're only going to have a few months in which to acquire the order of 10 to 12 million pounds into the spot market. And that's a very substantial proportion of the volume that's been done in the six months year to date. On top of that, you've got financial players who are circling, who are looking for triggers to further capitalise their specialist investment funds, uh, which are investing in both in equities, but also in physical uranium through UPC and Yellowcake. Uh, you've got other uh, corporate activities that are sitting on the side, such as the uh, float and IPO of Uranium Royalty Corp. Uh, Scott said that they're just waiting for Section 232 to blow over and to get a bit of certainty into the sector. You've got Uranium Royalty Corp, which is somewhere in the system. Uh, now, on top of all that, we've seen the US utilities work down their inventory by 11 million pounds in the last 12 months. Uh, now, that's only 10%, but that means that their cover, their inventory cover is down to about two years. Um, 111 million pounds against a annual consumption in the order of 50 million pounds. Now that's getting back to normalised levels for our industry. They would probably think that that's a little bit heavy at the moment because they've been looking backwards at eight years of falling prices since Fukushima. But the moment you start to see some upward price momentum, those utilities are going to look at that inventory in a very different way and they're going to start thinking, well, hold on a sec, maybe two years. If, if I've just seen the price go up from 25 to 35 in the last two or three months. Gee whiz, I might need that two years of inventory cover. And in fact, maybe we should go back to the days where we've got two and a half years and mop up a little bit of this cheap spot while it's still available. So those sort of factors have a very rapid and compounding effect. And I see those things all operating entirely independently of any of the scenarios in section 232 that I've looked into, and I've looked into about a dozen. It's just clarity that we need in any form. If it's a quota, well, look, you know, that's 15 million pounds. Um, but as Scott Melby said at the conference, he said 15 million pounds is simply, and when I say, yeah, so 15 million pounds of US production, I'm talking about for your listeners that would need to come on. But the thing is, 15 million pounds is just a blip in a market that's quickly growing towards 200 million pounds. And a lot of that production will come on in any case as the market returns. So I can't see any scenarios that don't create a positive for the sector. The only question is, um, if we have a delay, as you say, that's going to put companies who have limited cash reserves under an awful lot of pressure. If we see this market go sideways for another six months, it's going to be great for companies like Bannerman, who've got the best part of $7 million and three years of runway sitting in our bank account. But it's going to be tough times for companies who've been holding out, just waiting for Section 232 to clear to then raise the next amount of working capital to cover G&A and their projects and so on. But as you say, that creates great opportunities as a, not only a uranium investor, but also for the um, stronger balance sheet corporates as well. But good companies are going to be able to raise the money regardless. And then folks are going to wear thin with regards to patients. And so you can count on, if, if it gets to delayed until 2020, or a lot of your folks in the, in the market are probably going to get uh, impatient. And as you know, a little bit of selling pressure from a small group can, can cause all of these equities to come down. So I think even if the spot price, and there's a clear disconnect, with the equities and the spot price, even if the spot price stays where it is frozen, the equities will continue to trickle out and bleed out. And uh, if you've got capital hanging around and you're not already 
all in uh, 200% on leverage, on margin, and you've maxed out all your credit cards that offered 0%, uh, if you have that available capital to deploy, you're going to get some bargains. And so even if we have that delay and we have that sentiment drop off even further and companies have to raise, it just all the more makes this whole thing, no pun intended, more explosive. And uh, I think that's the, the fascinating part of it. And, and there's just nothing else in the market like it. And so I'm just continue to be more and more excited. Excellent time to be around in this market. Couldn't agree with you more. And the nice thing is we're, we're going to know within a few weeks time. We're in the last minute of the game at the moment and the scores are locked and uh, the tension's high, but we know that we're not even going to finish our beer and we're going to know the answer to this game. So that's exciting. So where are you off to next uh, as far as uh, different events and so forth for the rest of the year? So the next event that's uh, big is the World Nuclear Association's annual symposium in September. That's in London. So I'll definitely be there. I'll be playing a role there. One of the things that makes this year's symposium particularly interesting is we are releasing the 2019 version of the nuclear fuel report. It's only released every two years, so there wasn't a release last year. And there's been a huge amount of work put into that to really refresh and reflect some of these themes that you and I have just talked about in terms of nuclear really coming back from a policy sense and so on. So I've played quite a role in that. I'm the co-chair of the demand subgroup. So in other words, that's the group that determines the projections for uranium demand between now and 2040. Very credible process, very complicated process, uh, gives you just fantastic insights into all of the different markets for nuclear power, um, but also you can't determine uranium demand without understanding conversion and enrichment and fabrication. Uh, so it's been a tremendous experience and a privilege to chair that committee and uh, embedded me um, into not only that working group, but given me some really interesting collegiate access to the most important people within the World Nuclear Association. So I'm really looking forward to it. The other thing that's important about the September conference is the industry is quite, the nuclear industry is quite fragmented. You know, you've got very, very complex um, componentry and plants and markets and so on with very, very clever people who spend most of their year heads down doing a fantastic job of managing these highly complex operations. And it's only once or twice a year that they all get together, they put their heads up, they start hearing and talking about what else is happening in the rest of the industry. And I think it's a tremendously positive message that will be coming out in September. We've had, for example, what we talked about, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change finally saying that we can't get anywhere on climate change without nuclear playing not only a role, but an increasing role. We've had other groups as well that are key policy drivers who are advocating for nuclear for the first time, as well as some really important events in the industry, such as Germany needing to step back from some of its political opposition within the EU, which has emboldened Poland to come out and declare that they are going to have a nuclear industry, uh, nuclear energy industry for the first time. So there's a bunch of different things going along. And what this conference does is all of those very important milestones in the shift of nuclear policy are going to be, get presented to the entire industry all at the one time. And people who haven't been thinking about that for one or two years are suddenly going to be confronted with the fact that we're back to having a vibrant, growing nuclear industry. We don't need to be looking over our shoulders at Fukushima anymore. Nuclear is really happening and it's recognised that it absolutely has to grow in order for the world to even start to address the climate change challenges that it has. And that's without even talking about what's happening in the developing world. The reason that's really important is it's that information that then comes back to the utilities who are the buyers of uranium. And I expect that they will leave London in September understanding that the paradigm has now changed in nuclear energy. They can't expect to be just putting in a flat demand line 
into their models or accepting the advice of the consultants who are telling them demand is going to be flat. There's a very viable, likely scenario which is strong demand growth in nuclear energy and therefore uranium. So you put that on top of the release of market activity post section 232. And that's why I'm very optimistic that we're going to have a very vibrant uranium market between September and the end of the year going into 2020. That, that's going to be interesting. I'm uh, considering. So Brandon, is there any is there anything else uh, that you want to add for the audience on, on uh, the Adelaide conference or uh, any other comments you'd like to make? Oh, well, I hope you enjoyed some of the cultural experiences, Andrew. We we tried to get you drinking some of those big Barossa Shiraz, but I see that you wanted to stick to the vodka, and I don't blame you for that. But it was good fun. It was nice having a smaller conference where you had great access. You know, if you think about some of the people that you and I dined with, uh, what an opportunity to sit around the table with those people, some of the real titans of our uranium industry and just chew the fat, talk sport, talk experience, talk what we did in college and university and so on. And that's a real advantage of both the fact that we're in a relatively small industry, but also when you get down to places like South Australia, Adelaide, and participate in a small conference. So I think the access to the individuals and the networks was very, very powerful and valuable. Absolutely, I second that. Unfortunately, I didn't get too far out of downtown of Adelaide given the tight schedule. But uh, from what I saw of Australia, it seems that they have their stuff more together upstairs than perhaps uh, the United States, which uh, which is a little bit hard for me to say. But nonetheless, I, I think that there is some, some real interesting talent that's coming out of Australia and uh, a society that is uh, certainly motivated to do quite impressive things. And uh, one of the interesting things I, I struggled with, though, is I could not come across, not only could I not get served the, the amount of vodka that I was seeking, I could not come across any Red Bull to keep me energized into the evening. And so that was a challenge. <laughs> maybe maybe we're in establishments that were a little bit too high end for the typical triple vodka Red Bull solution to jet lag that you were looking for. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was a fantastic trip and, and it was good. And yeah, I, I could not, I was struggling to, to, to come on with the red wine. You know, it's interesting. I didn't know Adelaide, that area there was was kind of upcoming uh, wine country. I didn't know that. And, and uh, so that was a that was an addition there. And then, of course, most of the guest taste was was towards the the wine. Uh, but yeah, I was trying to stick with something a little bit more lighter and heavier, uh, less volume to get the job done. And uh but no, it was it was quite impressive, and the travel back was fantastic. Uh, managed to stop by and spend some time with uh, Dustin Garo of Nuclear F Fuel Associates, which you're plenty familiar with, and uh, he's got a, a lot of work going uh, with uh, some of the updates of these new reports coming out, including the the WNA report that you mentioned in September. So he's busy, busy there in uh, Steamboat Springs. Highly recommended anybody who's in that area. Of Colorado or in that region of the U.S. to uh, to visit Steamboat Springs if you have not. Uh, fantastic area and uh, great ke catching up with Dustin and, and talking really the internal workings of the industry and uh, so that was enjoyable on my way back. Yeah, just Dustin really is a great contributor to the industry and I'm very proud that he consults to Bannerman Resources as our strategic nuclear advisor. So uh, we're very fortunate to have that constant and regular interaction at a deep level with Dustin. And I'm so pleased that you had the chance to get a look in as to what that really means in practice. I'm sure your head must have been hurting at the end of it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, we hit it pretty hard and, and uh, covered a lot of ground. And it was, it was fantastic to be able to do that in such a... Uh, pleasant environment uh, such as the highlands of uh, Colorado and back into the cool coffee country down here. So it was a great trip and, and fantastic to get out of the office. Good. Well, it was great to have you in Aussie. And as you say, we do manage to hit above our weight. We're only 20 million people down here, but we do have a pretty good impact on the world given how few of us there are. Well, Brandon, uh, I really appreciate you coming on and, and really covering this uh, 
conference uh, recap and uh, great to have your perspective here and, and it would, would have been a much better uh, having you on here talk rather than just myself trying to, uh, to cover it. So I appreciate you uh, consenting to come on and chat with us. Always great fun talking to you, Andrew. And um, I'm sure our listeners will really enjoy the wrap. Appreciate it, Brandon. We'll talk soon and uh, take care. Thanks, Andrew.